First Part of Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green. An Adventure of Violet Strange the female counterpart of August Dupin, Sherlock Holmes, and Craig Kennedy, undoubtedly the most unique and original detective in fiction, a witch woman, but always charming. Part One One more, just one more well-paying affair, and I promise to stop, really and truly to stop. But, Puss, why one more? You have earned the amount you set for yourself, or very nearly, and though my help is not great, in three months I can add enough. No, you cannot, Arthur. You are doing well. I appreciate it. In fact, I am just delighted to have you work for me in the way you do, but you cannot, in your position, make enough in three months, or in six, to meet the situation as I see it. Enough does not satisfy me. The measure must be full, heaped up, and running over possible failure following promise must be provided for. Never must I feel myself called upon to do this kind of thing again. Besides, I have never got over the Zabriskie tragedy. It haunts me continually. Something new may help to put it out of my head. I feel guilty. I was responsible. No, Puss. I will not have it that you were responsible. Some such end was bound to follow a complication like that. Sooner or later he would have been driven to shoot himself. But not her. No, not her. But do you think she would have given those few minutes of perfect understanding with her blind husband for a few years more of miserable life? Violet made no answer. She was too absorbed in her surprise. Was this Arthur? Had a few weeks' work and a close connection with the really serious things of life made this change in him? Her face beamed at the thought, which seeing, but not understanding what underlay this evidence of joy, he bent and kissed her, saying, with some of his old nonchalance, Forget it, Violet. Only don't let anyone or anything lead you to interest yourself in another affair of the kind. If you do, I shall have to consult a certain friend of yours as to the best way of stopping this folly. I mention no names. Oh, you need not look so frightened. Only behave. That's all. He's right, she acknowledged to herself as he sauntered away. Altogether right. Yet because she wanted the extra money... The scene invited alarm. That is, for so young a girl as Violet, surveying it from an automobile some time after the stroke of midnight. An unknown house at the end of a heavily shaded walk in the open doorway of which could be seen the silhouette of a woman's form leaning eagerly forward with arms outstretched in an appeal for help. It vanished while she looked, but the effect remained, holding her to her seat for one startled moment. This seemed strange, for she had anticipated adventure. One is not summoned from a private ball to ride a dozen miles into the country on an errand of investigation without some expectation of encountering the mysterious and the tragic. But Violet Strange, for all her many experiences, was of a most susceptible nature, and for the instant in which that door stood open, with only the memory of that expectant figure to disturb the faintly lit vista of the hall beyond, she felt that grip upon the throat which comes from an indefinable fear, which no words can explain, and no plummet sound. But this soon passed. With the setting of her foot to ground, conditions changed and her emotions took on a more normal character. The figure of a man now stood in the place held by the vanished woman, and it was not only that of one she knew, but that of one whom she trusted, a friend whose very presence gave her courage. With this recognition came a better understanding of the situation, and it was with a beaming eye and unclouded features that she tripped up the walk to meet the expectant figure and outstretched hand of Roger Upjohn. "'You here!' she exclaimed, 
amid smiles and blushes, as he drew her into the hall. He at once launched forth into explanations, mingled with apologies for the presumption he had shown in putting her to this inconvenience. There was trouble in the house, great trouble. Something had occurred for which an explanation must be found before morning, or the happiness and honour of more than one person now under this unhappy roof would be wrecked. He knew it was late, that she had been obliged to take a long and dreary ride alone. But her success with the problem which had once come near wrecking his own life had emboldened him to telephone to the office, and— "'But you are in ball-dress!' he cried in amazement. "'Did you think—' I came from a ball. Word reached me between the dances. I did not go home. I had been bidden to hurry. He looked his appreciation, but when he spoke it was to say, This is the situation. Miss Digby, the lady who is to be married tomorrow, who hopes to be married tomorrow, how hopes, who will be married tomorrow, if a certain article lost in this house tonight can be found before any of the persons who have been dining here leave for their homes. Violet uttered an exclamation. Then, Mr. Cornell, she began. Mr. Cornell has our utmost confidence, Roger hastened to interpose, but the article missing is one which he might reasonably desire to possess, and which he alone, of all present, had the opportunity of securing. You can therefore see why he, with his pride, the pride of a man not rich, engaged to marry a woman who is, should declare that unless his innocence is established before daybreak, the doors of St. Bartholomew will remain shut to-morrow. But the article lost. What is it? Miss Digby will give you the particulars. She is waiting to receive you, he added, with a gesture towards a half-open door at their right. Violet glanced that way, then cast her looks up and down the hall in which they stood. "'Do you know that you've not told me in whose house I am? Not hers, I know. She lives in the city. And you are twelve miles from Harlem. Miss Strange, you are in the Van Brooklyn Mansion. Famous enough, you will acknowledge. Have you never been here before?' "'I have been by here, but I recognize nothing in the dark. What an exciting place for an investigation!' "'And Mr. Van Brooklyn, have you never met him? "'Once, when a child, he frightened me then. "'And may frighten you now, though I doubt it. "'Time has mellowed him. "'Besides, I have prepared him for what might otherwise occasion him some astonishment. "'Naturally he would not look for just the sort of lady investigator "'I am about to introduce to him.' "'She smiled.' Violet Strange was a very charming young woman, as well as a keen prober of odd mysteries. The meeting between herself and Miss Digby was a sympathetic one. After the first inevitable shock which the latter felt at sight of the beauty and fashionable appearance of the mysterious little being who was to solve her difficulties, her glance, which under other circumstances might have lingered unduly upon the piquant features and exquisite dressing of the fairy-like figure before her, passed at once to Violet's eyes, in whose steady depths beamed an intelligence quite at odds with the coquettish dimples which so often misled the casual observer in his estimation of a character singularly subtle and well poised. As for the impression she herself made upon Violet, it was the same she made upon every one. No one could look long at Florence Digby and not recognize the loftiness of her spirit and the generous nature of her impulses. In person she was tall, and as she leaned to take Violet's hand, the difference between them brought out the salient points in each, to the great admiration of the one onlooker. Meantime, for all her interest in the case in hand, Violet could not help casting a hurried look about her in gratification of the curiosity incited by her entrance into a house signalized from its foundation by such a series of tragic events. The result was disappointing. The walls were plain, the furniture simple, nothing suggestive in either, unless it was the fact that nothing was new, nothing modern. 
as it looked in the days of burr and hamilton so it looked to-day even to the rather startling detail of candles which did duty on every side in place of gas as violet recalled the reason for this the fascination of the past seized upon her imagination there was no knowing where this might have carried her had not the feverish gleam in miss digby's eyes warned her that the present held its own excitement instantly she was all attention and listening with undivided mind to that lady's disclosures they were brief and to the following effect the dinner which had brought some half dozen people together in this house had been given in celebration of her impending marriage but it was also in a way meant as a compliment to one of the other guests a mr spielhagen who during the week had succeeded in demonstrating to a few experts the value of a discovery he had made which would transform a great industry in speaking of this discovery miss digby did not go into particulars the whole matter being far beyond her understanding but in stating its value she openly acknowledged that it was in the line of mr cornell's own work and one which involved calculations and a formula which if prematurely disclosed would invalidate the contract mr spielhagen hoped to make and thus destroy his present hopes of this formula but two copies existed one was locked up in a safe deposit vault in boston the other he had brought into the house on his person and it was the latter which was now missing it having been abstracted during the evening from a manuscript of sixteen or more sheets under circumstances which he would now endeavour to relate mr van brooklyn their host had in his melancholy life but one interest which could be called at all absorbing this was for explosives as a consequence much of the talk at the dinner-table had been on mr spielhagen's discovery and the possible changes it might introduce into this especial industry as these worked out from a formula kept secret from the trade could not but affect greatly mr cornell's interests she found herself listening intently when mr van brooklyn with an apology for his interference ventured to remark that if mr spielhagen had made a valuable discovery in this line so had he and one which he had substantiated by many experiments it was not a marketable one such as mr spielhagen's was but in his work upon the same, and in the tests which he had been led to make, he had discovered certain instances he would gladly name, which demanded exceptional procedure to be successful. If Mr. Spielhagen's method did not allow for these exceptions, nor make suitable provision for them, then Mr. Spielhagen's method would fail more times than it would succeed. Did it so allow and so provide? it would relieve him greatly to learn that it did the answer came quickly yes it did but later and after some further conversation mr spielhagen's confidence seemed to wane and before they left the dinner-table he openly declared his intention of looking over his manuscript again that very night in order to be sure that the formula therein contained duly covered all the exceptions mentioned by mr van brooklyn if mr cornell's countenance showed any change at this moment she for one had not noticed it but the bitterness with which he remarked upon the other's good fortune in having discovered this formula of whose entire success he had no doubt was apparent to everybody and naturally gave point to the circumstances which a short time afterward associated him with the disappearance of the same the ladies there were two others besides herself having withdrawn in a body to the music-room the gentlemen all proceeded to the library to smoke here conversation loosed from the one topic which had hitherto engrossed it was proceeding briskly when mr spielhagen with a nervous gesture impulsively looked about him and said i cannot rest till i have run through my thesis again where can i find a quiet spot i won't be long i read very rapidly it was for mr van brooklyn to answer but no word coming from him every eye turned his way 
only to find him sunk in one of those fits of abstraction so well known to his friends and from which no one who has this strange man's peace of mind at heart ever presumes to rouse him what was to be done these moods of their singular host sometimes lasted half an hour and mr spielhagen had not the appearance of a man of patience indeed he presently gave proof of the great uneasiness he was laboring under for noticing a door standing ajar on the other side of the room he remarked to those around him a den and lighted do you see any objection to my shutting myself in there for a few minutes no one venturing to reply he rose and giving a slight push to the door disclosed a small room exquisitely panelled and brightly lighted but without one article of furniture in it not even a chair the very place quoth mr spielhagen and lifting a light cane-bottomed chair from the many standing about he carried it inside and shut the door behind him several minutes passed during which the man who had served at table entered with a tray on which were several small glasses evidently containing some choice liqueur finding his master fixed in one of his strange moods he set the tray down and pointing to one of the glasses said that is for mr van brooklyn it contains his usual quieting powder and urging the gentlemen to help themselves he quietly left the room mr upjohn lifted the glass nearest him and mr cornell seemed about to do the same when he suddenly reached forward and catching up one further off started for the room in which mr spielhagen had so deliberately secluded himself why he did all this why above all things he should reach across the tray for a glass instead of taking the one under his hand he can no more explain than why he has followed many another unhappy impulse nor did he understand the nervous start given by mr spielhagen at his entrance or the stare with which that gentleman took the glass from his hand and mechanically drank its contents till he saw how his hand had stretched itself across the sheet of paper he was reading in an open attempt to hide the lines visible between his fingers then indeed the intruder flushed and withdrew in great embarrassment fully conscious of his indiscretion but not deeply disturbed till mr van brooklyn suddenly arousing and glancing down at the tray placed very near his hand remarked in some surprise dobbs seems to have forgotten me then indeed the unfortunate mr cornell realized what he had done it was the glass intended for his host which he had caught up and carried into the other room the glass which he had been told contained a drug of what folly he had been guilty and how tame would be any effort at excuse attempting none he rose and with a hurried glance at mr upjohn who flushed in sympathy at his distress he crossed to the door he had so lately closed upon mr spielhagen but feeling his shoulder touched as his hand pressed the knob he turned to meet the eye of mr van brooklyn fixed upon him with an expression which utterly confounded him where are you going that gentleman asked the questioning tone the severe look expressive at once of displeasure and astonishment were most disconcerting but mr cornell managed to stammer forth mr spielhagen is in here consulting his thesis when your man brought in the cordial i was awkward enough to catch up your glass and carry it in to mr spielhagen he drank it and i i'm anxious to see if it did him any harm as he uttered the last word he felt mr van brooklyn's hand slip from his shoulder but no word accompanied the action nor did his host make the least move to follow him into the room this was a matter of great regret to him later as it left him for a moment out of the range of every eye during which he says he simply stood in a state of shock at seeing mr spielhagen still sitting there manuscript in hand but with head fallen forward and eyes closed dead asleep or he hardly knew what the sight so paralyzed him 
whether or not this was the exact truth and the whole truth mr cornell certainly looked very unlike himself as he stepped back into mr van brooklyn's presence and he was only partially reassured when that gentleman protested that there was no real harm in the drug and that mr spielhagen would be all right if left to wake naturally and without shock however as his present attitude was one of great discomfort they decided to carry him back and lay him on the library lounge but before doing this mr upjohn drew from his flaccid grasp the precious manuscript and carrying it into the larger room placed it on a remote table where it remained undisturbed till mr spielhagen suddenly coming to himself at the end of some fifteen minutes missed the sheets from his hand and bounding up crossed the room to repossess himself of them his face as he lifted them up and rapidly ran through them with ever accumulating anxiety told them what they had to expect the page containing the formula was gone violet now saw her problem part two there was no doubt about the loss i have mentioned all could see that page thirteen was not there in vain a second handling of every sheet the one so numbered was not to be found page fourteen met the eye on the top of the pile and page twelve finished it off at the bottom but no page thirteen in between or anywhere else where had it vanished and through whose agency had this misadventure occurred no one could say or at least no one there made any attempt to do so though everybody started to look for it but where look the adjoining small room offered no facilities for hiding a cigar end much less a square of shining white paper bare walls a bare floor and a single chair for furniture comprised all that was to be seen in this direction nor could the room in which they then stood be thought to hold it unless it was on the person of some one of them could this be the explanation of the mystery no man looked his doubts but mr cornell possibly divining the general feeling stepped up to mr van brooklyn and in a cool voice but with the red burning hotly on either cheek said so as to be heard by every one present i demand to be searched at once and thoroughly a moment's silence then the common cry we will all be searched is mr spielhagen sure that the missing page was with the others when he sat down in the adjoining room to read his thesis asked their perturbed host very sure came the emphatic reply indeed i was just going through the formula itself when i fell asleep you are ready to assert this i am ready to swear it mr cornell repeated his request i demand that you make a thorough search of my person I must be cleared, and instantly of every suspicion, he gravely asserted, or how can I marry Miss Digby tomorrow? After that, there was no further hesitation. One and all subjected themselves to the ordeal suggested, even Mr. Spielhagen. But this effort was as futile as the rest. The lost page was not found. What were they to think? What were they to do? There seemed to be nothing left to do, and yet some further attempt must be made towards the recovery of this important formula. Mr. Cornell's marriage and Mr. Spielhagen's business success both depended upon its being in the latter's hands before six in the morning, when he was engaged to hand it over again to a certain manufacturer sailing for Europe on an early steamer. Five hours! Had Mr. Van Brooklyn a suggestion to offer? No, he was as much at sea as the rest. Simultaneously, look crossed look. Blankness was on every face. Let us call the ladies, suggested one. It was done, and however great the tension had been before, it was even greater when Miss Digby stepped upon the scene but she was not a woman to be shaken from her poise even by a crisis of this importance when the dilemma had been presented to her and the full situation grasped she looked first at mr cornell and then at mr spielhagen and quietly said 
there is but one explanation possible of this matter. Mr. Spielhagen will excuse me, but he is evidently mistaken in thinking that he saw the lost page among the rest. The condition into which he was thrown by the unaccustomed drug he had drank made him liable to hallucinations. I have not the least doubt he thought he had been studying the formula at the time he dropped off to sleep. I have every confidence in the gentleman's candor, but so have I in that of Mr. Cornell, she supplemented with a smile. An exclamation from Mr. Van Brooklyn and a subdued murmur from all but Mr. Spielhagen testified to the effect of this suggestion, and there is no saying what might have been the result if Mr. Cornell had not hurriedly put in this extraordinary and most unexpected protest. Miss Digby has my gratitude, said he, for a confidence which I hope to prove to be deserved, but I must say this for Mr. Spielhagen. He was correct in stating that he was engaged in looking over his formula when I stepped into his presence with the glass of cordial. If you were not in a position to see the hurried way in which his hand instinctively spread itself over the page he was reading, I was. And if that does not seem conclusive to you, then I feel bound to state that in unconsciously following this movement of his, I plainly saw the number written on the top of the page, and that number was 13. A loud exclamation this time from Spielhagen himself, announced his gratitude and corresponding change of attitude toward the speaker. Wherever that damn page has gone, he protested, advancing towards Cornell with outstretched hand, you have nothing to do with its disappearance. Instantly all constraint fled, and every countenance took on a relieved expression. But the problem remained. Suddenly those very words passed someone's lips, and with their utterance Mr. Upjohn remembered how, at an extraordinary crisis in his own life, he had been helped, and an equally difficult problem settled, by a little lady secretly attached to a private detective agency. If she could only be found, and hurried here before morning, all might yet be well. He would make the effort. Such wild schemes sometimes work, he telephoned to the office and... Was there anything else Miss Strange would like to know? End of the first part of Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green.